So to kick things off, um, our first talk is going to be called Doing Good in an Infinite Chaotic World. And our speaker will be Hayden Wilkinson. So Hayden is a PhD student in philosophy at the Australian National University. At the moment, he's also a visiting researcher at Princeton under a Fulbright scholarship. He works on ethics and decision theory with a focus on infinite ethics. Aside from doing research, he previously worked as acting head of operations at the Global Priorities Institute, and before that, founded EA groups in both Brisbane and Canberra. Please welcome Hayden. Thanks, Angeli, and uh, thank you all for coming, especially. To start with, here's a trolley case. You, you, can, you can either save one person or save five. Here, they're tied to trolley tracks, and you can stop only one trolley. But it's analogous to either donating to one charity which will save some, or another which will save many. Most effective altruists would save the five. Why? Many of us would say that the outcome of saving five is better. Better because it contains more moral value, more happy lives, or whatever you value. And here, with no other considerations present, we ought to bring about the better outcome, or at least we'd prefer to. But does that justification work? In this talk, I'm going to argue, maybe not, when we live in a universe that's chaotic and infinite. You may have heard of the problems of cluelessness or of infinite ethics. Both have some solutions, but today I'll show how, when we put them together, they're much harder to solve. First, our universe is chaotic. For many of the dynamic systems within it, if we make small changes, we end up having large, unpredictable, lasting effects. In the case before, of saving one or five, our decision would have major effects on the future. For instance, identity effects. Each person you save may go on to have many generations of descendants who won't exist if we don't save their ancestor. Those people will affect the world around, around them, making it better or worse, maybe even completely divert world history. We can't predict this. It's way too chaotic. And even if their lineage doesn't last forever, they'll also mess up other people's children. Delay a child's conception by a split second and a different sperm fertilizes the egg, with very different DNA. Hold someone up by even a second when they're on their way, way home to conceive a child, and you change the child's identity, and that of all their descendants. Those people you save will do this countless times in their lives, as will their children, so there will be even more unpredictable identity effects. Another classic chaotic system is the Earth's atmosphere, which is affected by having an extra person walking about. You may have heard of the butterfly effect, coined by Edward Lorenz, that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil uh, can set off a tornado in Texas. It's dubious whether a butterfly's wings actually overcome the vi viscosity of air to have this effect, but the CO2 emissions from your daily commute certainly do. So does every human breath, which releases 140 times as much kinetic energy as the flap of a butterfly's wings. If you save some people rather than others, they'll have a whole lifetime of breaths, CO2 emissions, and so on, changing weather patterns for millennia, making future lives better or worse and worse. Uh, and my favorite, gravitational effects. Human bodies cast a gravitational field, move our bodies, that field changes. If I save someone's life, their body continues to move around, hopefully. Uh, at the most extreme, from one side of the world to the other. This changes the distribution of mass on Earth, and so changes the force exerted on Earth by other planets, uh, due to what are called tidal forces. It's as though Earth changes mass by up to six milligrams. This changes our acceleration and so to our position. Over one day, this typically moves us by over this tiny amount. Not very far. But Earth is part of a larger gravitational system. For three or more objects, this gets chaotic. If you've heard of the three-body problem, this is it. So a change that's that small now will typically lead to a change of about a meter after 170 million years. Still not very far. But in 300 million years, keeps growing, it's a change of a billion kilometers, about the distance of Saturn from the sun. This will have a somewhat an effect on life on Earth, especially through the climate. Uh, just 1,000 kilometers would affect the climate as much as all human-induced warming to date. So a big change. And the solar system isn't the only end-body system we're in. Change the, bodies or change the positions of bodies here, and over a long enough time horizon, you affect other star systems too. Uh, so even if humanity ends, or ends up far away, our actions still affect future life. And there are plenty of others. Uh, note that 
almost all of these effects don't just arrive when saving, arise when saving lives, uh, but also in pretty much every decision we ever make, including whether or not to take a breath. But why is this a problem? Take the case from before of saving one versus five. We can represent it like this. The outcomes we could produce are world one and world two. Each contains some value at time one, proportional to one or five happy lives. But think about the longer term effects, up to some final time Tn. At later times, the value is unpredictable. From our perspective, it's random. So we represent it with some independent random variables, x and y. And we care about which outcome has the greater total value over all times. We can check this by taking the difference in value between outcomes over all times and seeing if it's positive or not, like this. That's the equation we get. Uh, and the difference between each of those yk and xks, uh, we can simplify that to a different variable, zk, which these will be independent and identically distributed with expected value zero, uh, which means on this model, we've got something called a symmetric one-dimensional random walk. As we add up all the way to tn, the sum will always look something like this. You may see the problem now. Uh, for, for random walks like this, there's always probability one that it's gonna come back to zero again. For any large n, any long time horizon, the chances of it being above or below zero by the end are 50-50. No matter how big a difference we have at the start, save a million lives, still, an outcome is only better if the line ends up above zero. So it's always 50-50 whether that action will actually turn out better than another in every moral decision we ever make. Hence, the cluelessness worry, as Hilary Greaves puts it. For any acts, we can't have the faintest idea which will have a better outcome. It's always 50-50. And that seems bad, uh, <laughs> to put it mildly. We, <laughs> we think we should save the five rather than one and should contribute to effective causes because it does more good. But actually, we have no idea whether it does more good. It's just as likely to make things worse but please don't get disheartened. This is a problem for objective betterness. As Hillary puts it, the same worry doesn't arrive for subjective betterness. We can say an action is subjectively better if given our uncertainty and the probabilities of different outcomes, it has higher expected value. So the difference between worlds one and two was this. And then the expected difference is this. The random variables have expected value zero, they disappear. So it's positive. Saving five is better in expectation. Hooray, we still have reason to save people. Uh, but we can only give these expected values when all possible outcomes are comparable. We don't know which outcome will turn out better, but we know that one of them will. So we can kind of average how good they are, we can get this answer. So problem number one. Here's another one, problem two. Uh, our universe could be infinite. Some leading theories of cosmology they say that we face an infinite future containing infinitely many instances of every physical phenomenon, including those which we care about, like happy human brains and so on. Uh, and this makes it kind of hard to compare outcomes. The, the total value in the world will be infinite or undefined no matter what we do. So we can't really say that any outcome is better than another. Thankfully, a few methods have been proposed which do say something, which uphold our finite judgments even when the future is infinite. I'll divide these views up as strongly impartial views, weakly impartial views, and position dependent views. I'll explain what each of these are soon. But as it turns out, all of these categories have problems when the world's chaotic. First, strongly impartial views. Those which say the comparisons of outcomes are independent of which persons obtain value in each outcome and independent of their times and places. I'll also assume from here on that comparisons are independent of other qualitative features, like people's hair color, um, since those seem even less relevant than their position in time and space. And this seems plausible. With finite populations, it doesn't matter who the people are who attain value or where those people are. All that matters is the total. So we'd certainly accept the implication that this gives, that if two outcomes have the same number of persons with each value, same number with value one, two, so on, then the outcomes are equally good. Uh, given by the squiggly symbol. And views like this aren't too rare. They're held by Ralph Bader and Matt Clark, for instance. Um, but strongly impartial views have strange verdicts in a chaotic universe. Here are the outcomes for saving one versus five. 
but looking at persons p instead of times. In world one, uh, one person gets saved at the start, over there. Uh, in world two, five do. But then, the values for each person are somewhat random, since we can't predict them. We also have different people existing in the future. So persons xa, xb, or per person a, person b, so on, uh, versus alpha, beta, so on. Uh, different people, but we have infinitely many in each outcome. Now, we can take a closer look at these x's. Each xi has a probability distribution, like this, although they need not be identical. Since we're clueless about the future, each person who does exist has some non-zero probability of any level of value between some minimum and maximum possible value, however much a human life can fit. But there are infinitely many persons with distributions like this. So this is what the outcome as a whole looks like, uh, with, on the side, the number of persons at that value. Infinitely many people at every level of value, in fact, the same infinite cardinality. Now remember, strongly impartial views only care about the number of people at every value level. And all that information is here for some outcome. In fact, every outcome will look just like this. Exactly the same, since they'll all have infinitely many x variables. They're identical in every way that matters. So any strongly impartial view has to say that these outcomes are equally good, that all outcomes are equally good. Uh, in this case, and similarly in this one here from before, and in every case we'll ever face. No action we ever take will have a better outcome than any other. FYI, this holds for expected values too. Uh, we never have any reason to save any number of people, and that seems implausible. So <laughs> I think we should reject strongly impartial views. We, we have to, to be effective altruists. Now, weakly impartial views say that comparisons are independent of which persons obtain value in each outcome pair. And like before, they're times and places. This is subtly different. If we've got two pairs of outcomes, uh, hang on. Yeah. If we've got two pairs of outcomes, worlds one and two, and worlds three and four, and both pairs contain the same number of people who get value A in the first world, one, one or three, and B in the second world, two or four, then we compare those pairs of outcomes the same way. World one's as good or better than world two, given by that symbol, uh, if the same goes for worlds three and four. Now, it's quite subtle, the difference. Uh, hopefully it will make more sense in a minute. Uh, this is weaker than strong impartiality. Outcomes don't need to be equally good just because they have the same number at the same values. But two outcome pairs need to be compared the same way without regard for who is in the pair. And this seems super plausible. To violate it, our method would have to make reference to specific people. would say, if Obama's in here, then we prefer that one. Or uh, this outcome is better if it is better for Obama, whatever. Uh, and here are some views which are weakly impartial. Uh, one basic starting principle, which is weakly but not strongly impartial, is Preto, uh, which you might have heard of before. It says, if worlds one and two contain the same persons and everyone gets just as much value in world one as world two, then world one's as good or better than world two. And if someone gets more value in world one, then it wins. So if we change nothing about the world except we make a few people better off or loads of people better off, that's an improvement. Uh, and that seems super plausible. Of course that's true. <laughs> if, if all I'm doing is helping someone and no other effects, then uh, it better be an improvement. Uh, for brevity, I'm just going to assume that any plausible view that's weakly but not strongly impartial satisfies this. In the literature, they all do. Uh, but there's, there's a problem <coughs> when we're in a chaotic universe. Take this very simple example. We save one person, P1, or another. And that changes which infinite set of people exists in the future. Uh, A and C, or B and D. Those people attain random values. For simplicity, just one, one, well, one or zero. And we can construct another outcome pair. Start with world four, which looks like this. It's the same as world one, but half of the C group over here, which I've split, uh, are better off. So world four uh, is strictly better than world one. It predominates it. Uh, and world three, same as world two, but some B people are worse off. Again, Predo says that world two is better, like so. Uh, but take another look at these outcomes. We can rearrange them. These pairs, uh, one and two and three and four, they have the same number of people down each column, uh, with such and such value in the first world and such and such in the second. And if we're even weakly impartial, there's no relevant difference. So we compare these pairs the same way. So we've got that result, and we've got this from Pareto. Now, if we say world one's better than world two, we get a cycle. 
assuming transitivity, that's a contradiction. Well, one is better than itself, that's nuts. Uh, and likewise, if we say world two is better, then we can, we can generate a cycle using some other worlds. We can still do it. So we can't say that world one's as good or better, nor that world two is. There's no way to compare the two. They're incomparable by any weakly impartial view which satisfies Pareto. And we can run this for world argument, which I adapted from Amanda Askell, uh, full credit to her, uh, to any realistic pair of outcomes in which our actions have chaotic effects. It gets more complicated, but it still works. And this also holds if we ditch Pareto, but that takes a few extra empirical assumptions, which I won't address here. So, incomparability, where does that leave us? Well, neither outcome is better than the other. So we have no reason to make either happen, just like before. This carries over to expected values too, which will be undefined, so we're left with no reasons to make the world better. Uh, but that seems wrong again, so I think we should reject these views as well. That leaves us with position-dependent views, which make comparisons at least sometimes dependent on where values positioned in space and time, even if outcomes are identical for all persons. And these are pretty common, including among economists. One example is discounting the future at some constant rate, which can solve the problem, but that places a different weight on different generations, which is morally kind of awful. Uh, sorry, economists. But discounting isn't the only option. There are views, like most of these, which give everyone equal weight. Now, why would we adopt these when it seems so morally irrelevant where people are in space-time? Well, look what happened when we didn't. Uh, even, <laughs> even weakly impartial views gave us incomparability everywhere. And weak impartiality is just the denial of dependence on position and other qualitative properties, which, like hair color, which seem even less relevant. So, actually, on a side note, using those other properties actually lead us to saying everything, all outcomes are equally good, so also terrible. But uh, we need to deny weak impartiality, and the least worst way to do it is position dependence. Uh, but as it turns out, that's not enough. Here's one basic rule. An outcome is as good or better than another if and only if we can take this sum here uh, of the differences between world one and world two up to some time, and for some time t0 onwards, uh, the sum is always positive or, ze or zero, yeah. Uh, in effect, we're adding up all the value in order based on time, and we keep track of which outcome's in the lead, whether the difference is positive or negative. If there's some time t0 after which world one is always in the lead, then it's the better outcome. Now, remember from the cluelessness stuff, uh, this difference will mostly be random. Some constant value at first, uh, how many extra lives we save, and then a series of random variables, z. And remember that this sum of differences formed a symmetric random walk, like this one. And like before, this walk will always come back to zero again and again, infinitely many times. It's what's called recurrent. But this sum is the difference between outcomes, and if it always comes back to zero, neither outcome keeps the lead forever. So overtaking is never actually satisfied, it leaves every single pair of outcomes as incomparable. Um, there it is again. And most of the other position-dependent views give the same result for very similar reasons. They just can't deal with a chaotic universe. Most, but not all. Here's that graph again. Remember, it's how much better one outcome is than the other as we sum value over time. Now, it might keep going back to zero, but what if it spends most of its time above zero, uh, like it does here? If we randomly took a cutoff time to stop counting somewhere along here, uh, the cutoff total would be more likely to be positive than negative. We can think of a, an expected total value as a, a random cutoff, or at a random cutoff somewhere, which is proportional to the area under the curve. With negative weight, uh, when the curve is below zero, sort of negative area. Uh, now, if the walk is positive most of the time along its sort of along its walk, uh, positive by a large amount, then the area is going to be positive too. And random walks like this actually have a nice property of definitely spending more time above zero or below zero as time approaches infinity. And the area always diverges to positive or negative infinity. In fact, in chaotic cases like this, the area is guaranteed to diverge one way or the other. So we can still use this area, or expected total, to say something. Uh, something like this, which Complicated, won't go into too much. Uh, that integral there just gives the area under the curve that we just had. Um, and I want to say that if that integral diverges to positive infinity, first world is better. And that's guaranteed to hold for chaotic outcomes like ours. Um, we don't get incomparability anymore, so problem solved. 
So coming, going back, of course, we're still uncertain. In the long run, the walk could end up mostly positive or negative. The area could diverge either way. No matter how well it starts off, it's 50-50 which way it'll be. So we're still clueless about which action will turn out better. It, but at least they're comparable, uh, which means we can maybe run expected values and say which actions are subjectively better, like in the finite case. We're back to where we started, which is better than where we were later. So anyway, uh, in summary, uh, if you take an aggregated view of betterness in a finite world, you'll be clueless about which act, act will turn out best. But we can still say what's better in expectation, uh, since outcomes are at least comparable. But they're not in infinite worlds. Uh, the problem comes back to bite us. Due to chaos, many views can't say that any outcome is better than another. Views including all strongly impartial views, all weakly impartial views, which respect Pareto, many position-dependent views, but not all. And we can still say that some outcomes are better and that we have corresponding reasons to act, but we have to hold a view that's dependent on the positions of value or something even less plausible. Uh, and that's a strange conclusion. Either we care a bit about position, uh, which seems so morally irrelevant, or we accept that we have no reason to make the world better. Thank you. <laughs> that's all. Okay, so our discussant for this talk will be Michelle Hutchinson. Michelle is head of advising at 80,000 Hours. Before joining 80,000 Hours, Michelle helped to set up the Global Priorities Institute at Oxford University, and before that, she was the executive director of Giving What We Can. She has a PhD in ethics from Oxford on prioritization and global health. Please welcome Michelle. Hey, thanks so much for that, Hayden. It was a really interesting talk. Um, and clearly talking about some really important questions. Uh, seems absolutely mind-boggling to me that because we're in an infinite world, it could be the case that everything's incomparable um, and that somehow it doesn't seem better if a whole bunch of people don't have intestinal worms. <laughs> does seem like a really strong reason to accept position dependence, but then seems very strange that it matters where in time value actually happens. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was that the talk um, really just uh, covered what would be the case if we were in an infinite world rather than what we should believe given that we're uncertain over whether the world is finite or infinite. Um, and you might think that given our uncertainty, actually we should act as if we're in a finite world because uh, the idea that we're in an infinite world and everything is incomparable doesn't seem like it says that much about what are, what actions we should take. Whereas the chance of us being in a finite world and different worlds being comparable in the ways we should expect seems like it does have a bunch of consequences for our actions. So maybe we should just go for that. Um, another thing I was thinking about was um, the fact that as you presented it, position dependence is uh, just inherently totally implausible, but it seems like there are some ethical theories which think that position of value matters. So you might think that for egalitarian views, they care about whether value is spread out or whether value is clumped. On the other hand, it seems kind of weird if the world being infinite is what makes us accept egalitarianism, uh, if we didn't think that uh, we should act on egalitarianism in a finite world. Um, so I was trying to think a bit more about why infinity might make a difference to whether or not we accept uh, position dependence. Um, seems pretty impossible to actually think through an infinite world where there's infinitely many copies of me doing different things, some all doing the same and some doing different things. But I guess when I try to do that, it feels a bit more plausible why from the point of view of like our galaxy or something it really matters uh, whether there are fewer people suffering and whether I choose the outcome that means fewer people suffering but then from the point of view of all of these infinite copies it kind of stops mattering in which case I guess that seems to push towards um, position dependence only mattering at a really macro scale rather than at the scale that we can actually in any way see, um, which would give us some idea of why um, our intuitions are how they are, because they're entirely formed based on this galaxy, not on infinities, um, and seems to 
indicate that the kinds of position dependent theories that you were uh, covering are the more plausible ones because they're the, the actually working at the macro uh, uh, stage rather than uh, any that we could notice. Um, and then, yeah, the, the uh, position dependent theory that you were actually covering was based on timing rather than different spatial positions. Um, which seemed like maybe more plausible when thinking about actions because you take an action at a particular time and therefore you might think that what, at the time I'm taking the action, I only care about the consequences in the future rather than the ones in the past. And so I actually do care where the value is positioned. Um, overall, I guess I ended up feeling that uh, I was pretty confused as to how implausible it was <laughs> to accept uh, a position-dependent view, but that probably even if we did accept a position-dependent view, uh, it would have similar kinds of outcomes for our actions as the more intuitively plausible forms of consequentialism. Um, and also that given that we're not sure about whether we're in a finite or an infinite world, probably even if we think that we aren't willing to bite the bullet of position dependence, we're still going to have to act morally rather than just you know partying all the time. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I assume I can. I have time to respond. Um, yeah, so I, I, I might just follow up on, on a few particular bits. Uh, so for one, uh, yeah, uh, as far as this looking at uh, sort of comparing worlds over time rather than over space um, and taking account of the particular time at which we're taking actions, uh, I should probably note as like a very general thing that I've, I've presented uh, a very simpli simplified version of my view, uh, just like looking over time rather than like the full four dimensional four-dimensional manifold that we might affect. Um, yeah, we, we also want to account for like possibly infinite value over space. Um, several cosmological theories say that's what we've got, so we would be able to deal with it. Uh, and yes, yeah, there, there are all sorts of bells and whistles we can sort of add on, which do seem independently plausible, uh, that let us sort of say things a bit more. One of them is uh, specifically uh, that we don't, uh, that we can ignore the time and place at which an action is taken. Um, so we sort of supervaluate over all possible times this action might be taken, uh, and only when every possible point agrees, the, the judgment that's generated from using that point agrees, uh, then we say that one, act, one, one outcome is better than another. Um, I guess that does seem good for being able to actually compare the value in worlds yeah. rather than the value in worlds shifting all the time compared to yeah. what action you're looking at or yeah. where you are in time. Yeah, for, for instance, if two different agents are standing on different sides of the room and they're both considering actions which bring about, uh, pairs of actions which bring about exactly the same consequences in the future, I don't want it to be the case that I, I should do something and you should do the opposite thing. Um, that would be slightly crazy, that sort of agent dependence. Um, so we can avoid that. Uh, it slightly weakens the view, but like not by a significant amount. Um, yeah, there's also issues with special relativity, but, and it gets more complicated, but anyway. Um, yeah, uh, on another note, how plausible is position dependence? Uh, yeah, it, you, you mentioned that it would give similar judgments to finite consequentialism. In fact, uh, if the universe turns out to be finite, then it will give exactly the same judgments. Um, it's consistent with finite standard maximizing consequentialism, it implies it in the finite context, but if it turns out we're in the infinite context, then it still implies things that we want. Um, it keeps going, whereas sort of standard consequentialism sort of breaks down. Um, so all, all of the views I was talking about, the sort of citations, are, are extensionally equivalent, um, or they're, they're equivalent in the finite case. Um, yeah, uh, the only actual difference, or the, 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 only, the only situation where uh, this position dependence would give sort of surprising results uh, where we're preferring some positions over other positions is when we're dealing with like in infinite collections of positions. Uh, so we would, we would care more about ben benefiting, say, uh, if we look at sort of like future years of the universe, we would care more about benefiting every second year than we would care about benefiting every third year because every third year is more spread out. Even if they're, you know, qualitatively identical people that live in those years, uh, it's still the case that we, we want to say every second year there's sort of more of them. Um, just because that's the way that we're sort of uh, thinking of thinking of more. Um, but if we're, if we're thinking about benefiting sort of, you know, someone here or someone in 10 years, we will say exactly the same thing as the, the finite consequentialist. They both count equally. Um, 
Yeah, I should probably hand over to questions like now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so um, we have time for one question from the audience. I'm just going to read one off from the Bizabo app. Um, so one audience member asked, how does the model change if we assume that the walk isn't random and that, for example, good actions are more likely to have good consequences than bad ones? Is this a decent assumption? Uh, yeah, so it, it depends on the situation. Um, in <coughs> Hilary Greaves' paper, she, uh, she talks about cluelessness, uh, like the basic cluelessness problem uh, where both, both actions have outcomes which sort of randomly vary by roughly the same pattern. Uh, we have no, no, way, no reason to think that like one will have a different, uh, a better or worse outcome in 100 years than the other. Um, but so other actions are sort of systematic and it seems that, well, there's lots of reasons sort of conflicting, uh, pushing us one way or the other. Uh, if we have an action that we think will sort of uh, consistently make the world better over time, then of course like, we'll, we'll be able to say that that's better. And in fact, like, that would probably avoid cluelessness if we have sort of sufficient credence that it will continue to have this lasting good effect. Um, also, as far as the, uh, the random variables, if they're not uh, fully random, if they're not uh, independent and identically distributed, uh, identically distributed over all time, that's okay. Uh, for instance, the future could be better than the present. There could be sort of an upward trend, but still the variations uh, from like a very trivial act of mind, like breathing or not, uh, the variations will be random and symmetrical because I have no reason of thinking, thinking my breathing right now is going to sort of make life better in the future. Life in the future might be better, but my, the, the change incurred by me is sort of entirely symmetrically random. Yeah. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Let's thank Hayden and Michelle one more time.